Okay. Hi, Julie. How are you? Hi. It's great to meet you. Oh, nice to meet you, too. Thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Well, it's a delight to be here, especially anybody who owns a, a golden doodle is a friend of mine. <laughs> oh, you've seen, <laughs> you've seen our boo boo, have you? Yeah. I did. I did. Yeah. Cute. He is a cutie. He'll be uh, eight years old this year. He's getting up. There. Oh my gosh, that's a long time. Yeah. Well, they're so loving. Oh, he's a great dog. Very smart, but very opinionated too. Oh boy, uh, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> so you are a spiritual director, transformational coach and author, according to your bio. Yes. Uh, tell us what a spiritual director is. Well, a spiritual director is somebody, somebody who works with people to help them reconnect with the divine. And that could be in any form. It could be in the Hindu religion, the Buddhist religion, the Christian, the Jewish, the uh, Muslim, whatever religion, it doesn't matter. But the spiritual director really guides someone to discerning, hearing, and experiencing the divine call and the divine message. Okay, how did you get involved doing that? Well, uh, I've always been rather spiritual, and I went to seminary for about 10 years, and I discovered that um, there are these, there is this occupation, and it, of course, it was developed many, many years ago, hundreds of years ago, in the monasteries, the priests would were, would uh, provide spiritual direction to one another, and only gradually it's come out, and now it's available to the public. But it started in the Catholic Church, and then it went over to the Protestant Presbyterian Protestant Church, and now it's available to all people. But I got. I, the way I got into it was I first became a chaplain in a hospital, and I realized that it was really good work that resonated with my calling. And so I actually went and got training to be a spiritual director. I think the way that the world is situated at the moment with COVID and with the political turmoil in the United States, I think spiritual guidance is more needed now than it's been <laughs> in some time. Well, um, I always say, people ask me, well, how do you define God? <clears throat> and I have to say, I finally, after many, 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 many years of trying to figure it out, I agree with Gandhi. He, Gandhi said, God is love. And that's kind of what I feel. So what, um, when people are going through a lot of chaos, I think we're living in a chaotic time. You have to have like a center or a foundation that you put your feet into. And for me, uh, from a spiritual point of view, that foundation can be love or, you know, genuine caring and empathy for people. Well, I think that is good. Yeah, and I do believe that. I think God is love. God is a very difficult thing to try and define. There's many different terms different people use. Uh, I don't take one particular religion over another. They do tend to overlap on a lot of the key issues. But I think the core issue of all the religions is this idea of God whatever your definition might be. I've heard the term um, collective consciousness used as a way to define God, which that's OK. I can I can shuffle that one around in my brain as well. Well, and in some circles, and by the way, I travel in many spiritual circles, but in some circles they are saying that humanity is now rising to the next level of consciousness. Or to put it another way, we're moving to um, 
the fourth and fifth and sixth dimension. And um, then other people that are politically focused, they say, but the world is a mess. How can you talk about that happening? It can't be happening. <laughs> We're going through chaos. And so I want to put out a new idea, which is the idea that um, we can be doing both at once. In other words, as chaos goes up and as our awareness goes up, the chaos can become less of a focus. And pretty soon our higher awareness will bring order to the chaos. So it's kind of an exchange. And that's what I'm promoting. Well, your book is called Grief to Gratitude, A New Way to Deal with Grief. And we were talking about challenging times. And I think as well as COVID and uh, the political turmoil in this country right now, we also have technology that is beating on people's door faster than I think they can comprehend it. And I think that's causing a lot of stress for people. Essentially, in the last 30 years, people's lives have shifted almost completely online for some things. Mm -hmm. You know, banking, particularly news gathering, how you uh, how you view your media. All these things have changed so radically. So one of your talking points is pivot to change in challenging times. Uh, what do you mean by that? Explain that to us. Well, I mean, people, many people are being forced right now to reevaluate their housing, their uh, financial situation, their work situation, their family setup and structure, their uh, educational goals, and so on and so forth. So, um, rather than getting it's possible the normal thing is to just get stuck in being depressed sad or angry or resentful about all this change going on but i'm promoting the idea that it's possible to make rapid change and pivot easily if you follow a few basic steps and a few basic ideas and one of them, it's quite contrary to this emphasis on technology. And that is, I think we are in a point, at a point in time where we're in the danger of losing connection to our souls because we're so focused on the technology, which yeah. is really yeah. you know, the mind, it's the brain. But the soul is something we have to preserve and our connection to. So what I recommend is that people take a deep dive down into their soul to find out what is their soul's calling? What is their true purpose? And then pivot uh, to in that direction. Because if you're losing housing, finance, income, career, you might as well uh, find out what is your true purpose here on earth and follow that because that's going to be much easier. <laughs> and there's a number of steps that you have to, in my opinion, that would make it easy to, to do that. So if you uh, bring your heart along with you on the journey, and if you put the ego aside, and if you let your soul guide you to the destination and you use your intellect to steer the journey, then you're able to move quickly. That's what I found. Okay, well, it's very interesting that you brought up the idea of reconnecting with the soul and how technology tends to be stealing that away. I have this conversation with a lot of musicians and artists that come on the show. And my biggest beef, if you will, is that as technology has increased, music specifically is losing its soul because so much of what we hear, the noise that's being created, is being created by a machine and not by a human being, either with their voice 
or playing a musical instrument. And when I hear music that is primarily created with computers and artificial sounds, it has no soul. It doesn't raise the hairs on the back of my neck. It doesn't provoke any kind of emotional response. But if I hear a voice of a beautiful singer or somebody playing the piano or a guitar, it puts me in that wonderful kind of serene place, which I think is a connection to the soul. Yes, I, I fully understand and agree with you. Okay, so what was one of the steps? We've got about two minutes. What's one of the steps we can do to reconnect? Well, I recommend that people get in touch with their heart's um, rhythm. And sometimes when you're going through a lot of chaos, you might be surprised to discover that um, immediately there might be sorrow or anger or regret in your heart. And I do think it's healthy to connect with that and release it. And then you can go on and renew yourself. So that would be a starting point. And I have, you know, a number of ways to do that. But I think for me, the fastest way is to call upon the divine. And whenever I'm in the presence of you know, the divine, my heart opens. So that is the method that I've used as a chaplain and a spiritual director and a coach, even especially even as an executive coach, working with people that are mentally focused. <laughs> I've had them do a dive into their heart to find out what's going on in there. <laughs> and sometimes we need help with that. And when you say connect with the divine, do you mean through prayer? Well, there are many ways, but I mean, dancing is a way. Um, prayer is a way. I, I, pref I do like prayer very much, but then that's the discipline that I've been devoted to. But music is another way to go. Um, I mean, there is music. Um, there's a guy who wrote this um, set of music called Graceful Passages, which I highly recommend for grieving or just getting in touch with your soul and the divine. And so those are the three top methods I would recommend. Well, it's, it sort of goes back to what we were just talking about with music, how some music can put you in a very serene, state of mind, almost a euphoric feeling. And that that is probably getting in touch with the divine, if you want to use that terminology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would go for that. Okay. I, would, I would buy that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, sounds good. Uh, we do have to kind of wind this down. Your book is called Grief to Gratitude, A New Way to Deal with Grief. There it is. Hold it up a little higher. There we go. And how long has the book been out? It's been out about a month. How's it doing? It's doing well. It's, it's a very short book. It's only got about 80 pages. Uh, it's, it's really a how-to book. And um, it's really um, the foundation for the method I use when I'm coaching people to make a pivot. Okay. Uh, do you have a website you want to give out where people can check out the book? I do. It's called the Good Life. Uh, no, not not the just GoodLifePath.com or KramerCoaching.com. Okay. Well, we'll put both of them up. Okay. Then people can choose. All right. Well, Julie, thanks so much for coming on the show and sharing. Uh, this was very enlightening.